asked, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He whose hands are clean and his heart is pure, who doesn't lift up his soul to what is false, nor swears to God deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Well, we're going to sing now a version of that psalm to begin our service this morning. It's number 24 in our blue books. 24b, you'll see there are uh, two versions of the psalm. We sing the second one, and if you notice in the refrain, there are the letters A and B. So ladies, if you sing the A, and uh, the gentleman will respond with the B. Number 24b, the earth belongs to God, the world, its wealth, and all its people. do sit and we join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. We come before you, O Lord our God, the King of glory, and we bow before you with reverence and with awe, indeed with trembling, for you are a holy God, the one who cannot look upon evil cannot be touched or tainted by all that is false and wicked, cannot be known by any who would presume to approach you with pride, with arrogance, without the humble obedience, the contrite heart that is your desire for human beings. But in your goodness, Lord, your extraordinary grace, your mercy, your loving kindness. You've stooped to receive such as we are. You have revealed yourself so wonderfully in the gospel of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And you've drawn us through him into the very light of your life, to the nearness of your presence, to the joy of your holy assembly. And so, Lord, we grant our praise and the worship of our hearts to you alone. And we ask that you would grant us your continuing grace, your continuing power, so that our hearts would always be pure, so that our hands would always be clean, never scorning you, never swearing deceitfully so as as to bear your name, but really to give our hearts to other gods, to other things, to idols, to the desires of this world alone. Never that, Lord, we pray. Keep us seeking only the face of the God of Jacob, the one revealed in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, of all power and might, who art the author and giver of all good things, grant us in our hearts the love of your name, that it might increase in us true faith and nourish us with all thy goodness and of thy great mercy. Keep us in the same always. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed uh, to all of you this morning. If you're uh, with us here for the first time in the Tron Church, then uh, let me welcome you especially, and uh, we trust that you'll feel very much at home with us. Uh, that goes for all of you. If you're up here and I can see you, or if you're in one of the two halls downstairs, I hope you can see and hear us, and uh, I look forward to meeting and greeting you uh, at the end of the service. Can I draw your attention to these uh, service sheets here? Uh, one or two things to mention to you. You'll see on the inside that... Uh, on the left-hand side, there's uh, all the information you ought to need for uh, our gathering today. It tells you about Sunday schools and creches and so on, uh, and all of that. On the right-hand side, there are notices for all the different things going on in the life of the church this coming week. I'll leave you to read most of those, but let me draw your attention uh, to Wednesday evening in our congregational church prayer meeting at 7.30. We meet together here, uh, folk from across our congregations, to pray together as one fellowship for the Lord's work around the world, for our many mission partners, uh, and also for the work of uh, our own church here. So please do come and join us at 7.30. It's where you really get a feel for uh, the, uh, uh, the life of our church uh, family together. So uh, do join us. On the back page there, a couple of things. First of all, under Nota Bene, our evening service uh, this evening, instead of our usual pattern of the afternoon meeting at 4.30 at Queen's Park and the evening meeting here at 6.30, we have a joint uh, evening service tonight so that all of us can come together in one place. That will be at the Kelvin Grove building. Uh, if you've not been there, it's in Claremont Street, just basically down Bath Street, one mile, and uh, you bump into the other church building there. Uh, if, you, if you need help, please ask somebody would. Uh, We'll be able to tell you how to get there. It's an important evening. We're welcoming some new staff, our new apprentices, uh, and also setting aside a number of new elders in the congregation. Uh, and it's a great opportunity together to give thanks to God and to look ahead uh, to all that we'll be doing in the, in the term ahead. So please do make every effort to come and join us. Not here. No one will be here at 6.30. Do not come here. That You will be on your own. Kelvin Grove, 6.30. Please do uh, go there. Finally, from me, uh, one of the uh, sheets uh, in the uh, uh, notice sheets here is a flyer for this conference that we've been mentioning already, Sex and the Gospel, A Better Story, a day of teaching, encouragement, equipping for Christians in this whole uh, very, very um, hot area of contemporary discussion. Let me encourage you to book up for that if you see at the bottom. If you book before October the 1st, it is cheaper. Uh, if you book uh, afterwards... Uh, it is more expensive. Students can come for £5. Uh, after the end of October, for you, it is £250. So uh, it really is worth uh, uh, getting yourself organized. Uh, a big difference. Uh, but this is a crucial conference for so many folk. There'll be folks from many churches across the west of Scotland, and uh, we expect there to be a big demand for places. So please book up. You will not be treated preferentially just because this is your church. It won't be your church on that day. It'll be for those who bought a ticket. So you heard it from me. Don't complain later on. You've plenty of time. Get your ticket and uh, do come along to that day, which will be 
an excellent day. Andy Ritson is going to mention uh, the, uh, the student notices. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Andy. And alongside Katie, who you might have passed on the way in, we oversee the student and young workers work here in the church. And if you are new to this city because you're a new worker in the city or you are a student, um, then I just want to give you one small piece of advice first and also to make you aware of two events that we have on this week for you. So first of all, the piece of advice. Well, you will be tempted like most people are when they come to a new city to try and um, try out every single church that's available to you and hope that you find the perfect church. Well, my advice to you is that you will never find the perfect church and you certainly will not find it here at the Tron because we're a pretty flawed bunch here. Um, rather, my advice to you would be to try and find a church that preaches the gospel faithfully, that's welcoming, that's willing to invest in you. And if that's the case, it might not be here, although I hope it would be here. Um, settle down quickly, get involved, and start serving in that church, and then it'll feel like home. If you don't do that, it'll be four years down the line, and you're still hopping around churches trying to find the ideal place for you. So settle down quickly is my first piece of advice. And to help you do that here at the Tron, because even though you might not settle here, we'd like you to settle here, um, we have a couple of events on for you this week. So the first one is straight after this service. We have a student lunch uh, and young workers lunch. There's a few people in the congregation who have cooked up a storm this morning and would like to take you back to their houses to host you and get to know you better. And it's a great opportunity for you to get to know the church family and to ask any questions you might have of the church in a very informal uh, setting. So please do take us up on that offer. We'll be meeting downstairs in the Glasgow room straight after the service for coffee. And then we will pay you off with um, families to go back to their houses. So if you have any questions on how to get there, just try and find somebody with one of these name badges on and they'll point you in the right direction. Secondly, we have an event on this coming Thursday, um, which you'll find information of on these little flyers, which are in your book, um, in your notice sheet. And we are going to be having a scavenger hunt in the city centre for all students and young workers. Um, we did something similar last year. It was a lot of fun. It's really just a good chance to mingle with people who are already students and young workers here in the church to get to know them. And also just a good opportunity to get your bearings um, with the city that you've chosen to call your home for the next few years. Um, so please do come along. It won't be intimidating. We'll mix people up and there'll be a bit of healthy competition too. So put that in your diaries. Well, thank you, Andy. If you'd take your Bibles, we're going to turn to our reading now for this morning, which is in Deuteronomy uh, chapter... 23, and we're going to read the first half down to verse uh, 14. And it is, as you will see, a somewhat challenging reading. Deuteronomy 23 at verse 1. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. No one born of a forbidden union may enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Because they did not meet you with bread and water on the way when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor in Mesopotamia, to curse you. But the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. Instead, the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you, because the Lord your God loved you. You are not to seek their peace or their prosperity all your days forever. But you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian. Because you are a sojourner in his land, children born to them in the third generation may enter the assembly of the Lord. 
When you're encamped against your enemies, then you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. If any man among you becomes unclean because of a nocturnal emission, then he shall go outside the camp. He shall not come inside the camp. But when evening comes, he shall bathe himself in water. And as the sun sets, he may come inside the camp. You shall have a place outside the camp, and you shall go out to it. And you shall have a trowel with your tools. And when you sit down outside, you shall dig a hole with it and turn back and cover up your excrement. Because the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore, your camp must be holy so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. Amen. May God bless to us his word. Well, as we just read, our God is a holy God. That means we must take him very, very seriously. And we're going to sing a hymn that reminds us of that now. It's number 159. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. as our offerings for the Lord's work are received now and as the musicians uh, play quietly. You might like to read again these words. We'll be studying together shortly. Uh, or perhaps just to be quietly in prayer for those that uh, you know particularly to be in need at this time. As we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received.
Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we bring our gifts before you, joining them with all the giving of our fellowship, we turn our hearts to this world, the world that you so loved, but a world which still rages with strife of all kinds. We think of the threatlings and the noise, the instability, the fear emanating from North Korea at this time. We think of the television pictures that we've all seen of the strife among the fleeing people from the borders of Burma and all that that entails. We think of the ongoing strife, warfare, fighting, dispossession of so many people in the Middle East, the civil war still raging in Syria, the territories being possessed and now dispossessed from ISIS. So much of this world, Lord, is not right, not thriving and flourishing in the life for which you've created it. Think of the natural disasters that have been so much in our focus and attention just in recent weeks. The hurricanes in the Caribbean, the earthquakes. Think of the political machinations that fill our newspapers and news screens constantly. In Westminster, in Holyrood, Brussels, the United Nations. Men and women of power and of influence and of might, but so often in turmoil, so often at odds, so infrequently displaying the harmony, the joy, the flourishing of a world as you have purposed it to be. And we're reminded, Lord, of the great problem that lies at the heart and the root of every other problem in our world, natural as we call it, and human. The great rift that there is between this world and its maker. A world that has turned its back upon you, upon your life and light, your wisdom, your instruction for life and turn to its own way and reaped not only the wind but the whirlwind. And so Lord as the people of this world are so easily able to see all that is wrong but so often it seems so veiled they cannot see what is the answer and what is right. We pray for the light of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to be made known in this world, in every part. We pray, Lord, for your church all throughout the world, committed to the holy task of bringing the good news of the Lord Jesus, the command of the sovereign to repent, to turn from what is false and foolish, and to embrace that which is full of the life and the future for which we all long. We pray, Lord, for your church in parts of the world where it is uh, persecuted and suffering and yet so often in these very places so strong. We thank you for the way that your gospel is not chained, that even where there is great opposition, often it is in these very places where people are coming in great numbers to see the joy that is in Jesus and to gladly follow him and become his. We pray for our own nation, Lord, where for so long we have not been persecuted, not challenged as your church, and yet so often it seems asleep or afraid. We're seeing no great reason to trumpet abroad the great good news that you have given to us. We pray, Lord, for your church that in every place this morning in our nation where people are gathered as we are in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that it would indeed be his word, his command which is heard and his grace which is proffered. We thank you for every opportunity at this time of year in our city and in many others of new students coming to universities and colleges, many leaving home for the first time 
and he having the opportunity, perhaps for the very first time, to have an encounter with Christian people, those who love your word, who know your truth, and who long to share the light, the joy, the life that is in Jesus Christ. We pray for the Christian unions in our own universities here in this city and pray that in all that they do, every endeavor to make Jesus known, you would bless them and encourage them and honor their witness. We thank you for the network of UCCF all throughout this nation, all the help, the resources, the support that they give to student groups, large and small, all through these islands. And we pray, Lord, that in these early days of term, there would be many who are able to hear the good news and to see for themselves in your word, to examine the claims of truth that we have found and cherish and love so greatly. And so, Lord, among us this morning, as we come to your word, with all its challenges, we pray that you would open our eyes and the eyes of our hearts. Draw near to us, Lord, we ask. Help us and feed us with everything that comes from your mouth. Show us, we pray, the wondrous things in this your law and send us on our way rejoicing because we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As we come to God's word then, we continue in prayer as we sing the words on the screen, uh, our version of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father God who dwells in heaven, draw near to hear your children.
please do take your Bibles at Deuteronomy chapter 23, page 165, if you have uh, one of the Blue Visitor's Bibles. Now, you can't read even to the end of the very first chapter of the Bible without realizing that the God that this book reveals to us is the God of life. He is the creator of abundant, flourishing, pervasive life. And so, of course, when we come to consider the law of of God, which Paul calls the law of righteousness, of rightness, then his Torah, it's the Hebrew word for law, it really means instruction. His instruction is instruction for life, for life that is right, fulsome, flourishing, abundant, and indeed, life that conquers death itself. Proverbs 12, verse 28 says, in the path of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. And so we've been studying together here Moses' instructions, his law for life in these central chapters of Deuteronomy. And he is here fleshing out and applying the core of God's instruction, the Ten Commandments, which are so concerned with life, with health, uh, with human flourishing. Uh, And we recently saw that great emphasis on cherishing life in the exposition of the Sixth Commandment, not to murder, that's what you find in at chapters 19 to 21. But of course, the very cradle of life is the family. And that must therefore, obviously, also be very, very carefully protected and guarded fiercely. And so we saw these instructions on uh, protecting the nuclear family in chapter 22, safeguarding the creation ordinance of marriage between a man and a woman. That's why those verses teach us that sex must be pure, it must never be perverted, certainly must never be predatory or even premature. But of course, all through the Bible, there is, as you know, a very clear link, isn't there, between the nuclear family and between the whole covenant family of God's people. That's why both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there's a concern for right ordering, for distinctive purity of both the domestic household family and God's whole household, his family, which you'll notice here in verses 1 to 8, six times uh, is referred to as the assembly of the Lord or the congregation of God's people, as some uh, translations have it. The ecclesia of the Lord, that's the Greek word translating uh, this in the Greek Old Testament, where we get our word ecclesiastical. It means church, the ecclesia, the church of God. You might remember the words that we used to have on our uh, service sheets every week from 1 Timothy 3.15, where Paul says he is writing that you should understand how to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. And that is what our passage here this morning is all about. It's all about the distinctive purity which God's family, God's household are called to and simply must display in this world. I grant you, at first sight, may seem very odd. I'm not sure what you thought when we had a reading about castration and urination and defecation, among other things. Probably not uh, quite what you were expecting uh, this morning. I have to confess, it's unlikely to be the passage I would choose when I'm invited as a guest preacher for somebody's uh, special service. You can imagine the email coming. Oh, Mr. Philip, could could you give us your reading for the anniversary service? Yes, that's fine, no problem. Deuteronomy 23, verse 1, do let me know if you need anything else. (laughs) Radio silence. (laughs) Who is this person that we've invited to come and preach? I'd be surprised if you find this passage on the back catalogue of the Keswick Convention, for example. However, here it is. It's before us this morning, isn't it? And it must be God's word for us today. And in fact, I can tell you, I have discovered that it is a vitally important word. In fact, it is actually the message the whole Bible is deeply concerned with in every place from the very beginning to its end because it's the issue of who may belong to God's household and how we're to behave in his household when we are given a place within it. So let's try to get a grip uh, with this, by uh, get to grips with this, by looking first at verses 1 to 8, which are all about belonging to the assembly of the Lord. Now, what these verses, verses teach us is that at its heart, God's household is an assembly that is gathered for holy worship. 
That is for real and intimate communion with the Lord himself. And that real spiritual worship, that right relationship with God, that sharing in the life of God must therefore be holy. That is, it can only come about God's way through obedient faith. Or to put it another way, you must wholeheartedly embrace the holiness of God and not hostility towards God or else you can never belong among those who truly know him. Now that is the clear apostolic command in the New Testament. Hebrews 12 verse 14 says, Strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Very plain. But that is precisely what these verses in front of us this morning are telling us as well, in their own very graphic way. So let's try and understand them. The emphasis here, as I've said, is on the assembly of the Lord. That is, a people who are set apart from the world for God and for God alone. Now, that's the basic meaning of holy. It means set apart for God, for God's kingdom. And that's the key to all the examples that are given here for those for whom it simply cannot be so. It's the key to understanding what is being said and what isn't being said. Let me uh, begin by reading from Derek Kidner. These provisions, he said, should read not as rebuffs for the handicapped, but as stipulations designed to guard the church of the Old Testament and to express in vivid physical, verse 1, social, verse 2, and historical terms, verses 3 to 8, to express its calling as a company of the redeemed without blemish or reproach, a people apart, and yet not a wholly closed community. God's church is not a wholly closed community, even here in the Old Testament. That's so, so important. And we'll come back to that. But it was then and is now and always will be a people apart, a holy assembly to the Lord who is a holy God. And so not all may belong truly there if they exclude themselves by wholeheartedly embracing not God's purity, but perversity, the perversity of a world and a whole worldview that is opposed to God. And that's very important. The last chapter, the very last chapter of the Bible ends with that vision, doesn't it, in John's vision in Revelation. Blessed are those who have washed their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, so that they may enter the city of God by its gates. But outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. And it's exactly so here in these verses. Verse 1, you see, speaks of excluding from the assembly of God those who are perversely mutilated. There's a deep perversion, isn't there, of the natural order of God's creation of human beings as male and female. And we've seen already in chapter 22 how deeply concerning that is to God. It's an abomination to him. And we need to take that seriously today in an age of such confusion, indeed an age of obsession in that whole area. But here it's much more even than that, you see, because almost certainly this refers to a ritual mutilation which is done as part of the worship of false gods, of pagan idols. Bodily mutilation was a great feature of pagan worship in, in that age. And we've seen that already in chapter 14. Do you remember the, uh, the shaving, the tattooing, the cutting uh, of these mourning rituals and so on? And uh, self-mutilation was often practiced as a way to get special recognition with God, as a way to get a special status in the pagan priesthood and that sort of thing. That might seem extraordinary to us, but the truth is that false religion has always had a history of all kinds of uh, reprehensible practices, including bodily mutilation. Child sacrifice was a terrible feature of the pagan religion of the Canaanite day, and God warns his people against that. We saw that in chapter 12. Human sacrifice, cannibalism, was a part of many such faiths. The Incas, for example, celebrated for their buildings, but they killed people and ate them. All kinds of uh, dreadful practices like that. Even today, we're conscious, aren't we, of female uh, genital mutilation. Well, that's a practice that's tied up with cultural and religious practices of falsehood and of filthiness. So it's not quite uh, as obscure as you might think. 
And it's certainly not anything at all to do with prejudice against uh, disabilities or against certain ethnicities. This is given as a warning to Israelites, lest any of them should think that they could still remain among the assembly of the Lord's people and themselves go and take part in any of these pagan uh, idolatrous practices. Well, that's quite a relevant word, isn't it, for the church today? There are plenty of people in the Western world in the professing church of Jesus Christ who would say that embracing the practices of other religions are in some way enlightened and helpful and uh, good for the church. Not at all, says the Bible. Remember Deuteronomy 12, verse 31. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way because every abominable thing that the Lord your God hates, they have done in their worship of their gods. And we should have a caution, I think, also, shouldn't we, in an age when bodily disfigurement, again, is becoming increasingly fashionable in all sorts of ways. We as Christians need to think hard what it means that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies, says Paul, are to be presented as living sacrifices, holy, well-pleasing to God, not conformed to the ways of this age, to the perversities of those who, in fact, would disfigure the image of God. So we need to think about that. And verse 2, you see, continues this theme of perverse opposition to God in this example of a, a child of a forbidden union. What does that mean? It's not just speaking about an illegitimate birth. The authorized version says, no, no bastard shall enter the congregation of the Lord. But it's not that. It's a rare word. And almost certainly, it is talking here about a child that is conceived deliberately through ritual prostitution at an idol's temple. In other words, it's a child that is born and dedicated in life to the service of a false god. Think about it as a sort of reverse perversion of the birth of Samuel. Do you remember Samuel's mother prayed and uh, the Lord granted him a child and she dedicated Samuel to uh, the Lord's service for all of his life? Well, this is exactly that, but it's to a pagan, filthy, idolatrous, false god. And that's the point. And since that antipathy, that opposition to the true God would run in families, well, it's understandable that he says none of that ilk could ever possibly be at one with the true people of God, even to the tenth generation. That's a way of speaking about as far as you can possibly imagine, forever. Now, that might seem harsh, but here's the truth, friends. If, as parents, you're hostile to God, and you're utterly committed to a worldview that is opposed to God's way in every way, and you're determined to dedicate your children also to that lifestyle and that way of look, uh, outlook on life, then it is highly likely that they will embrace that same falsehood, isn't it? And that'll go on down the generations. And it's salutary for all parents here, for all prospective parents, because we are living not just for ourselves, but we're living for our children. And your children will learn... To worship your idols. It's a frightening truth. If your real idols are football or fashion or money or career or whatever it is, whatever it is that really eclipses your worship of the true God in your life, that will be what you're training your children in. Can't help it. That is what you will be dedicating their lives to, these idols. That's why we need to be careful, isn't it? If you're paying lip service to the one true God in your Sunday best, but actually you're giving your life service to other gods, then you need to be warned. Not only may you very well be excluding yourself from the assembly of the Lord, from fellowship with him, but very likely you'll be excluding your children, your grandchildren. We need that warning. All of us, the gospel warns us in that way. We can't prostitute ourselves with the pleasures of the temples of this world and preserve ourselves for the purpose of the temple of the Lord. It's just not possible. What fellowship has light with darkness, says Paul? What agreement has the temple of the Lord with idols? We are the temple of the living God. And again, that point is made again in verses 3 to 6, you see, with this question of the perverse hostility of Moab and Ammon against God's people, and therefore against God himself, of course. But notice verses 7 and 8. 
concerning Edom and Egypt, which makes it absolutely clear, again, that this exclusion is not about excluding all foreigners, but rather excluding those who showed and who continue to show extreme hostility and opposition to God and to his people and to the advance of his kingdom in the world. You can read the story in Numbers 22 to Numbers 24. It's what verse 4 speaks about here. Not only did the Moabites not help Israel when they were coming out of Egypt, but they went to extreme lengths to harm them. They hired Balaam to curse them. And of course, God extraordinarily turned that curse into a blessing for Israel. But look at verse 6 here. The curse became attached to those who would have cursed forever, says verse 6, so that even to the 10th generation, none of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Now, friends, if you think, but hang on, this is just the harshness of the Old Testament speaking here. I need to remind you, don't I, of Jesus' words. Read Matthew chapter 25 later on about the sheep and the goats. It's not, by the way, a passage uh, speaking about uh, the neglect of the church in caring for the world's poor, as so often people seem to take it. It is precisely the opposite. It's a passage strongly challenging and indicting the peoples of this world for hating and for not loving the people of the Lord Jesus Christ, the brothers of Jesus himself. And Jesus says, when you didn't feed them, when you didn't clothe them, when you didn't help them, when you didn't visit them in prison, the least of these my brothers... You neglected to do all these things to me. And it is these, says Jesus, who will go out into everlasting punishment. Depart from, these are his words, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus' words, excluded forever, just like verse 6 here in front of us. Not, notice, not because of their ethnic background, but because of their evil behavior towards God and his kingdom. Whereas, you see, as verses 7 and 8 show, it need not be so. The Edomites, even though very often they were enemies of God's people, and Egypt also, great enemies, although before that they had succored them. If they sought a place honestly among the people of God, they could be admitted ultimately to the assembly of the Lord, not excluded by birth, but admitted by faith and trust in the true God, if indeed that faith was true and genuine. That's the point of the third generation here. By the time you've had your children and grandchildren, well, it's obvious then that you really do mean business. The Bible's never naive about these things. It's not just saying, oh yes, I've become a Christian. No, 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 no. New Testament is just as clear, isn't it? Jesus says it's those who abide in me, who keep my commands and are fruitful that are truly mine. It's those who endure to the end, who are saved. That's the Bible's constant message. It's exactly the message of this chapter. To really belong to the assembly of the Lord, the gathering of the redeemed, to really worship God in truth, to know Him, means wholeheartedly embracing His holiness, His way, in persistent, real submission to Him and to Him alone. To have an undivided heart. That's how, how the Apostle James puts it. Fearing God alone, not, not sharing him with a whole lot of idols of this world. Not sharing him with those who actually are utterly opposed to him. Draw near to God, says James, and, and he will draw near to you. But that means, he says, cleansing your hands, purifying your hearts from double-mindedness. It means embracing holiness, not hostility to God. Humble yourselves, he says, before God, and he will exalt you to that place of real fellowship with him. That's the only way to belong in intimate fellowship with the Lord. Because God opposes the proud, says James, those who think you can live perversely and still love God purely. No, no, no. He gives grace to the humble who submit themselves wholeheartedly to him, knowing it, the truth of the old hymn that says, there is a city bright, but closed are its gates to sin, not that defile it shall ever enter in. That's the message of the whole Bible. And it's exactly the message here of verses 1 to 8 of our chapter about those who can belong to the assembly of the Lord. 
And the theme of holiness is exactly the same when we look at the second half, verses 9 to 14, which is all about behavior in the army of the Lord. What this section reminds us is that God himself is an, uh, uh, God's household is an army gathered for holy war. And the real power in the midst who wins those battles is the spirit of the living God himself. And that means that all true spiritual warfare also must be marked by holiness. That it must acknowledge God's priorities. That it must acknowledge God's presence in the midst of his people. You see, verse 9 here gives the general command to holiness. Verses 10 to 14 just give uh, two examples to show in a practical way what that, what that means and what it's symbolized by. So verse 9, you see, is saying, in effect, this. It's saying, the battles of the Lord must be holy. And you must keep yourself from any taint of unholiness. You must do God's kingdom work in God's kingdom way. Because, look at verse 14, it is God's work. It's God who's doing it. He really is in the midst of his people. His spirit really is in the midst of your camp. And by the way, notice six times the reference to camp the camp of the Lord, just as the word to the reference of the assembly of the Lord in the first half. And God's Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And so just as Paul says to the Ephesian church in his letter to them, which is all about battles, isn't it? All about being armed for real spiritual warfare. Still, he says to them, their walk, their camp, if you like, is to be one worthy of the calling that you have received. You're to be walking in the light and the love of the Lord, not like the pagan world. You are to walk as children of light, not as darkness. There's to be no hint among you, says Paul, of any impurity, any immorality, any filthiness, any crudity, any corruption. Read Ephesians 4 and 5. That's what he says. Walk, he is saying to them, march even to war as children of light. For the fruit of light, he says, is found in all that is good and right and true. Well, isn't that just exactly what's being said here? It's holiness. It's not health that's the chief concern of these regulations here. Although, as, as Chris Wright points out, if you're looking for a Bible reference to back up the old adage that cleanliness is next to godliness, then probably this is uh, quite a good one. But actually, they are related, aren't they? Because holiness is wholesomeness. It's about health. It's about wholesome humanity. It's about the humanity that is embodied above all in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And hence, you see, these, these instructions here that we find a bit embarrassing about bodily functions, about toileting. Verse 9, you see, when it speaks about avoiding every evil thing, it's not, it's not talking here about moral wickedness. It's talking about immodesty. It's talking about unseemliness, inappropriate behavior even when you have to answer the call of nature, which everybody has to do. And that's what it's about. Verse 10 is, is uh, talking, I think, about urination, almost certainly. Some people think it's um, uh, uh, the same as Leviticus 15, verse 16, but that's a different matter, a different language, and so on. And the context, I think, is clear. Verses 12 to 13 are clear. They expressly talk about excrement, don't they? And it's quite difficult to find just the right language to use here publicly. I want to avoid unnecessary crudeness, but I also want to avoid the sort of titters of um, uh, using the language of the nursery. So I'm just going to take refuge in the old medical euphemisms of the consulting room. We're talking here about passing water and moving bowels. But it's quite clear, isn't it? It's a natural thing. It's a necessary thing in life. It's nothing evil in themselves. But in the Lord's army, God is saying, extra care and thought is needed even there because, verse 14, God himself walks in the midst of your camp. He is the great fighter for you. And he is holy. And so you must be holy too. He mustn't see anything indecent lest, look, lest he turn away from you. And that would be total disaster, wouldn't it? And even around about the camp, he says there in verse 13, there's to be absolutely no danger of the Holy Lord of Heaven being sullied by treading in some human filth. I mean, you can't have a more vivid image than that. But he's saying, isn't he, just what Paul is saying to the Ephesian church, don't grieve away the Spirit of the living God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. God cannot and will not dwell among a people tainted by filth. 
The filth of bitterness and wrath and anger and slander and malice is what Paul's talking about to the Ephesians. But just so here, that's, that's what these graphic examples signify to us. He's not saying that these are the only things that God care about, physical filth. That's nasty, but it can be washed off. That's the symbolism, isn't it, of verse 11 there. These things can be cleansed. But it's the attitude that these things represent. A careless attitude completely to the presence of God. A scorn for the majesty of God and for his holiness. That's what it's about. There's nothing wrong in itself if you're camping, just nipping out to the front of the tent and revealing yourselves just right outside the door at night. Let me tell you, as somebody who's camped in the wilds of Africa, ask Charles, he'll tell you. You want to keep one foot inside that tent, you you might need to get back in pretty quickly. But imagine your camp is the camp of the royal guards of Her Majesty the Queen. And you're feeling a bit caught short. But Her Majesty might just be out for a pre-bedtime walk with the corgis. Well, you'll think again, won't you? You won't have that cuckoo before bedtime. You'll hunker down in that tent until it's safe in the morning. Well, I hope so anyway. I hope there's respect for Her Majesty the Queen. But how much more for the Lord of heaven and earth? See, somebody's put it this way, habits and attitudes that in ordinary circumstances are unimportant assume an entirely different significance in his presence. Because our priorities must be shaped, mustn't they, by the presence of the king and by the priorities of his kingdom advance, which is a matter of waging his warfare, which is a holy warfare, in his way of utter holiness. This is telling us that there's a beauty of holiness that must pervade even the battle camp of the Lord our God. Because we really do know the joy of his real presence in the midst of us. It's the same message, isn't it, in Revelation 1 to 3, where there's that picture of the Lord walking among the lampstands that represent the churches of Christ. He is in the midst of us. And that changes everything. It affects everything. Everything we do, and it affects the way that we must do everything as his church, the way even that we do battle, the way that we fight. It must be marked by holiness, by wholesomeness, even in the bitterest and darkest battle. Paul says that we are people who are to spread the fragrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, he says, some people will oppose it, but it's not to be opposed on the grounds of them finding some indecency, some filth in the midst of our camp. That is, our message of the gospel may offend and will offend, but our manner is not to be carelessly offensive. We are not to emanate pride and conceit and anger and hatred and so on as God's people. We're not to emanate anything filthy or disgusting. Our warfare is not to be the way of harsh haranguing and protest. It's to be the way of humble, honest persuasion. That's the apostolic teaching. We are not to be people who go about doing dreadful things like waving placards saying God hates faggots, things like that. Never. We're to be a people who go calling urgently all people to honor the way of God's holiness along with us as we do the same. See, never, never let there be that nasty aroma of unburied excrement around the church of Jesus Christ in the world today, which is his camp, the church militant, doing his warfare. That's a lesson some Christians need to learn, isn't it? It's one that we all need to remember, especially when we do have to fight great gospel battles. If we want the Lord himself not to be grieved away from us, because he won't be part of something that is unholy. Just let me say one more thing on this business of God's eye, always looking at his people, being on his people, because that is sometimes something that uh, induces great fear. Listen to William Still on this. He says, Our guilt-ridden minds tend to regard his perpetual inspection as an overshadowing threat, like the stab of guilt that we have when we merely see a policeman. But we should rather think of this divine oversight as part of God's search for pleasure in his children. Certainly, that's what he hopes for. That's what he longs for. It's the good, not the bad, that he's looking for, hopefully. Look at verse 14. He walks among his people as their deliverer. 
as their savior, not their destroyer, because he wants to be delighted in us. He doesn't want to be disgusted in us. He's looking for the good. He's looking for a holy people. And that is the camp and that is the church that he will always honor with his presence and with his power to deliver, to banish enemies, to bring his great peace. See how there's nothing negative about God's holiness. God's call of grace is that we should belong to his holy people, a people who are set apart for him and a people who behave like him as his holy ones. That's how our camp is to advance the glory of God on this earth. There is a negative necessary in that call. Of course there is. The gates of God's assembly are firmly closed to sin, firmly closed to persistent hostility against him. That has to be so. But it's that very negative, isn't it, that makes the overwhelmingly positive call of God's grace just so visible and so wonderful. Turn with me as we draw to a close. Turn with me to Psalm 24 that we began the service with. I think it's page 458 in the church Bibles. And listen again to verse 3 and the question, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? That's our question, isn't it? Who can truly belong to God's own household, to his intimate family, to the assembly of the Lord? And the answer is there in verse 4. Only he who has clean hands and a pure heart. And we can read that and despair. We can say, oh, that can't be me because my hands are not clean. Think of all the things that I have done. And my heart, oh my goodness, how far from pure that is. If only you could know. No, no, no. That is completely wrong. Read this psalm. We think it means only the perfect person could ever enter God's true family in his assembly. That is not what this says. Look at verse 4 again. The second line tells us, doesn't it, what it means to have clean hands and a pure heart. It means, he says, not lifting up your soul to what is false. It's one of the Old Testament words for idols, false gods. And it means not swearing deceitfully. That is not taking God's name and claiming you serve him, but actually doing it deceitfully because at heart you are really serving false gods. Just as the people in verses 1 to 8 in our passage are. Now look at verse 6. Instead, the Holy One, the one whose hands are clean and heart is pure, is the one who seeks wholeheartedly only the face of the God of Jacob. Verse 5 says, he will receive blessing from the Lord. He will receive righteousness from the God of his salvation. Do you see? True holiness is not about being perfect. It's not about being sinless for us in this world. Not at all. What it is all about is seeking wholeheartedly and only the face of the true God of Jacob, the God of grace who revealed himself absolutely and completely in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever you've come from, wherever you've been, whoever you are. And that's why the whole Old Testament, even here, shows us that God's household is not closed wholly. It is closed to those who only seek sin, but it is open to sinners who will only seek Him. Not every cult prostitute not every Moabite was excluded forever from the assembly of the Lord. Read on into Joshua and you'll read of one called Rahab, a cult prostitute of the temples of idols who turned from that and threw in her lot with the God of Israel and her people. Then there was Ruth, the Moabitess, and she came inside among the Lord's people, calling on the name of the Lord. Your God shall be my God and your God my people and many, many others. And as the story of God's people went on and on towards fulfillment, the prophets made it ever more clear of the scope and the wideness of God's great invitation to join in with his people. Isaiah the prophet in chapter 56 said these words, for soon my salvation will come, says the Lord, and let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will reject me from his people, and let not the eunuch, the man whose testicles are crushed, let not him say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house, within my walls, 
a monument and a name better than sons and daughters, an everlasting name that will never be cut off. Even Jeremiah speaks about, would you believe, Moabites and Ammonites in that great day being restored when the great mighty day of the Lord comes. And at last, the Lord of heaven himself came near, so near, taking our own flesh and blood in the person of Jesus Christ to destroy forever all wickedness and to call to belong forever to his great assembly, men and women, boys and girls from every nation who by nature would be excluded forever from his presence because of sin and unholiness, but who through Jesus Christ are made holy, are justified, by the Spirit of our God. And when you read in the New Testament, the book of Acts, the good news of Jesus begins to go out from Jerusalem to the very ends of the earth. The very first pagan Gentile that we encounter is who? The Ethiopian eunuch, who's going along in his chariot, reading from the very scroll of Isaiah, where that extraordinary promise to people like him is found. And he was brought in, made holy. And then you have Saul of Tarsus, Worse than any Moab or Ammonite, breathing out cursings against God and his people. And he is brought in to belong to the household of God. And then a whole household of pagan uh, people under uh, Cornelius is brought in. And every one of them washed. And no one could deny that the spirit of the holy God has been poured out even on pagan Gentile outsiders. And then the whole city of Ephesus is full of the smoke of burning books from occultists and Satanists and idol worshippers, burning everything that belonged to the past and coming in to belong to the everlasting assembly of the holy. Grace abounding even to the chief of sinners, as Paul described himself. Not because holiness doesn't matter any longer to God. Not because just anyone or anything now can come into the assembly of the Lord. No, no. Nothing unclean shall ever enter it, says John, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. Paul is just as clear, isn't he? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindles. None of these will ever inherit the kingdom of God. Closed are its gates to sin. But open, open still while there is time, are those gates to sinners who repent, who will seek the face of the God of Jacob and him alone. Because such were some of you, says Paul to them. But you were washed. You were made holy. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Who can belong to the assembly of the Lord our God? Who can come in to that household of everlasting joy? Only the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. But that means, friends, according to every promise of this book, that means everyone who will call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ single-mindedly, wholeheartedly, rejecting all other, not any longer lifting up their eyes to what is false, but seeking the face of the God of Jacob alone, whose smile radiates now to all the world, in the face of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And if perhaps this morning you think and you are here that somehow God would be reluctant to ever receive somebody like you into his household, his assembly, his family, because of, because of what you once were, because of what you still are, or because of what you have done, or because of what some people have done to you, you need to know you need to know that there is nothing on this earth that causes more joy to God in heaven than when someone who has been outside his assembly comes inside to belong forever to his household of joy. Jesus himself says there is joy among the angels of heaven over every one sinner who repents and comes to find their true home in the household of God, in the assembly of the Lord. Well, may there be great joy in heaven this very day because of that reason. Let's pray. Our oh, God and Father,
as we think on your awesome holiness. We cannot look upon sin and filth. How we marvel at the depth and the breadth of your extraordinary grace and mercy that calls us not to a closed door but to an open gate and the way in to a Father's heart and to a cleansing and to a joy that is everlasting. May every heart here this morning, we pray, know and be filled with that joy through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing to end our service of that open gate to the assembly of the Lord. It's number 676. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he this world that he gave us his son who yielded his life as an atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Number 676. Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears, Come. And let the one who is thirsty, Come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. And so, to that end, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>